everyone, welcome to this new live. It's actually been a super long time since the last time I did a live. I checked and the last one was on the 4th of August. So more than three months ago, it was uh, about time to make a new one. And I'm super excited because this, um, because this evening uh, we're doing one of my favorite format, which is taking a look at the future features of Swift. This time we're going to take a look at two features that will be part of Swift 5.8. So the next release that will uh, happen like uh, in the coming uh, month, I guess. I guess we can expect it to be released, I don't know, sometimes maybe first or second quarter of uh, 2023. Um, before we go into the topic, I just want to do a quick recap on uh, how it is possible that we can actually take a look at the future features of Swift. And the reason why we are able to do so is because most of uh, the Swift evolution process actually happens in the open, both on GitHub and on the Swift forums. And so on GitHub, you have a repo that lists what are called the Swift evolution proposals, which are documents where people either working from Apple or from the community uh, write a pitch for a feature that they think would improve the language. Those proposals are discussed and if they are approved, they get implemented and they get to become part of the language. And since some of these proposals have already been implemented for Swift 5.8, that's why we can already take a look at these future features. If you want to take a look at the documents yourself, you have, of course, the links in the description. In this slide, we're going to focus on two features, one around dealing with quick self enclosures and making the ergonomics of dealing with, with quick self enclosures better. And the second one about uh, making KeePath easier to use in debugging messages. So let's not waste any time and let's get started with the first topic called allow implicit self for weak self captures after self is unwrapped. So first thing that's always interesting to take a look at when you read such a proposal is to see who is the author. And so here the author is Carl Stephens. So if you don't know who he is, he's actually the same, is, is the person who has already implemented another new feature of Swift 5.7, and it was the shorthand syntax for if let. So now you can do in Swift just if let my optional. You no longer need to do if let my optional equal my optional. And that's thanks to him. And so he has implemented a second new feature that will be part of Swift 5.8. And something very interesting is that Cal is not someone working for Apple. He's someone from the community who actually wanted to contribute to Swift. So now let's move on to the introduction. So as of the Swift evolution proposal number 269, implicit self is permitted in closures when self is written explicitly in the capture list. We should extend this support to weak self captures and permit implicit self as long as self has been unwrapped. So this is the goal syntax. So we have a class which is a view controller. The view controller has a button. It has a function setup and the function dismiss. The button can register a handler for the tap event. And so we are registering a closure for that handler. In the closure, we use weak self because we don't want to have a retain, a retain cycle. We unwrap that weak self inside the closure doing guard let self else return. And as you can see in the goal syntax, you can call dismiss and you don't need to explicitly write self when calling that dismiss method. So this is the goal syntax, meaning that if you try to write this code in the current version of Swift, uh, the code won't work. The compiler will tell you, you have to explicitly mention self when you are using self inside an escaping closure. And the goal for this proposal is to say, okay, since we have a weak self and we have unwrapped it, the compiler should be able to be like smart enough to understand that we are in a context we are using self is both safe and non-optional. And so we should be able to call a method without needing to prefix it by self dot. So there is a the thread, the link to the thread on the Swift evolution on the Swift forums uh, where the proposal was uh, discussed. Now let's take a look at the motivation. So the reason why this feature should be part of the language. 
So explicit self has historically been required in closures in order to help prevent users from inadvertently creating written cycles. A previous proposal relaxed these rules in cases where implicit self is unlikely to introduce a hidden written cycle, such as when self is explicitly captured in the closures capture list. So this syntax here is valid syntax in Swift right now. And basically it says that if you explicitly capture self in the closure through the capture list right here, you are then allowed um, to call methods without needing to prefix them by self dot because basically you've already stated that the closure captures self and so there is no reason for the compiler to force you uh, to make it obvious that the closure captures self because you've already done it of your own volition, I guess. So that previous proposal left the handling of weak self captures as a future direction. So explicit self is currently required in this case. So this is the current valid syntax. If you take, if you capture a weak reference to self inside the closure and then you unwrap it, you still need to explicitly mention self whenever you are using self, even though using self here uh, runs no risk of creating a written cycle because you already have taken care of having a weak self. Okay. So since self has already been captured explicitly, there is limited value in requiring authors to use explicit self. This is inconsistent and adds unnecessary visual noise to the body of closures using with self captures. So as usual with that kind of life, I see the code, I make some comments and I basically just say what was written underneath and I hadn't noticed it. So what's the proposed solution? We should permit implicit self for weak self captures once self has been unwrapped. This code would now be allowed to compile. So this is the goal syntax we saw in the introduction of the proposal. Now let's move on to the detailed design. So enabling implicit self. All of the following forms of optional unwrapping are supported and enable implicit self for the following scope where self is non-optional. So first we have weak self and guard let self else return. So I guess this is like uh, the, the most popular syntax. Uh, so popular that uh, Xcode actually um, auto-generates that code when you start writing guard in a closure with weak self. If it's working as it's supposed to, it should automatically suggest to write this code. So then you have the same thing, but with explicit let self equal self, uh, weak self, and then an if let and writing the code inside the scope of the if let. Same thing, but with an explicit identifier for the unwrapped value. While let self, which is uh, much less common, but uh, that I guess has some use cases, maybe more in uh, in lower uh, in lower level code, uh, and same thing, but with the explicit name for the unwrapped value. Like with implicit self for strong and unowned and unowned captures, the compiler will synthesize an implicit self for calls to property slash methods on self inside a closure that uses weak self. If self has not been unwrapped yet, the following error will be emitted. So here in that code that assumes the proposal has been accepted, um, the developer is trying to call dismiss without explicitly mentioning self in a closure that captures a weak self and without having explicitly unwrapped self. And so the error would be explicit use of self is required when self is optional to make control flow explicit. So here you have to write self question mark dot, which makes sense because in that case, if the compiler didn't force you to write self question mark dot, it wouldn't be obvious that this code, that this call to the method could not happen if uh, self is nil. So it makes sense to draw attention to, to the fact that here you are calling a method on a potentially nil uh, instance. So just like the compiler forces you to use the keyword try when you are calling a throwing method or await when you are calling an async method, here it's the same logic. The compiler would um, force you would force you to explicitly say that that call could not happen because self was nil. Hello, Rosemary. So let's move on to nested closure. What happens if we have a closure inside a closure? 
So nested closures can be a source of subtle written cycles, so have to be handled more carefully. For example, if the following code was allowed to compile, then the implicit self.bar call could introduce a hidden retain cycle. So that's interesting. So we have a first closure that takes a weak self that unwraps it, okay? Then here we have, um, we are calling a method foo. Then we are passing a second nested closure that is calling another method bar and both are calling method using self. And so here, I guess that closure is actually capturing a non-weak reference of self, uh, hence the yeah, hence the potential hidden retain cycle. So following the precedent of the previous pro Swift evolution proposal, additional closures nested inside a weak self closure must capture self explicitly in order to use implicit self. Uh, let me read it again. Additional closures nested inside a weak self closure must capture self explicitly in order to use implicit self. So meaning that basically you get the implicit self only on the top level closure, we could say, but all nested closures, they have to explicitly capture it. Um, okay, so this code that we just saw would not be allowed. There would be an error, an error from the compiler that would say call to method method Uh, so I guess it's more like bar rather than uh, than method here. Uh, so call to method bar enclosure requires explicit use of self to make capture semantics explicit. What would be allowed would be to take another weak self inside the closure, explicitly unwrap it. Then you get as then you get again uh, the benefits of an implicit self. Also allowed is to explicitly capture self because here you are stating that you are capturing self. And so you're potentially creating your retain cycle, but at least you've been explicit about it. And finally, also allowed, uh, use the explicit capture of self. So the philosophy of the feature is really uh, make it, uh, make the code as uh, ergonomic, we could say, uh, when there is no risk of creating a retain cycle. But as soon as there is a risk, uh, one of the values of Swift is to focus on safety. So it makes sense that we don't want to write potentially unsafe uh, code without being warned by the compiler. Also following that previous evolution proposal, implicit self will only be permitted if the self optional binding specifically and exclusively refers the closure's self capture. That was hard to understand. So let's take a look at the example. So we have the closure takes a weak self. We do a guard let self equal self with a default value some optional with same type of self. Error, call to method in closure requires explicit use of self. So why is that the case? Um, why is that the case? I guess it's not about, okay, I think I understand it. It's not about retain cycles because here since, uh, I mean, Hopefully the, this should be like a uh, week, even though it could be a uh, own. Um, actually, it could not even be the case, but I guess the idea is to make it obvious that here you wouldn't be you, you wouldn't be necessarily calling method on self. You could be calling method on a totally different instance. And so the goal is to make that obvious. So it should be, uh, yeah, self dot method. So Honestly, here, you should have, I guess, another naming than self uh, right here, uh, first thing, because it might not uh, not be not, not be self, uh, like call it, I don't know, like a self or substitute, self or default. But I get, I get the idea, which is that if this syntax were allowed, uh, someone reading the code could think that method will always be called on self, so on the current instance, even though that's not the case. And so it makes sense to also make that behavior of the method being potentially called on a totally different instance explicit. Okay. We're actually getting near the end of that first proposal. It was a, it was a quick one. So now we go to source compatibility. So this change is purely additive and does not break source compatibility of any valid existing Swift code, which is uh, always uh, always a good thing. 
effect on ABI stability. Same thing, purely uh, additive. Even though I'm not gonna lie, I am far from being an expert on uh, ABI stability. Effect on API resilience. Uh, so once again, because so I guess it's like it's not breaking any existing APIs. Maybe it's, this is more related to the Swift standard library. But uh, once again, I am not 100% sure for that one. But then we get to one of my favorite sections, which is the alternative considered. Because here, um, that's where the author is going to discuss what could have been the other possible syntaxes to achieve the same goal and why they were not, uh, I mean, they were considered, but they were not chosen. And I think it's really interesting because one of the hardest parts when you are a software developer is uh, knowing how to design uh, one of the hardest parts is, is naming things uh, in general and uh, something more specific in the domain of uh, naming things is designing APIs and uh, it's always interesting to see like uh, what alternatives are considered but why they were not chosen because it gives you like uh, some ideas on what are the criterions, the arguments that you can apply when you have to make that same kind of decision uh, in your code. So that's why I particularly uh, enjoy this uh, this uh, section. But first, I see a comment in the chat, so I want to read it. So Remco is saying, what is wrong with just writing self every time and keeping things simple? Python is super popular for good reasons. Swift could learn from that. Um, that's, that's an interesting comment because first, it shows uh, the fact that when you make a proposal like this, uh, you need to convince people that it makes sense. And actually, one of the biggest job of someone m making, proposing such a change is to convince the community that it makes sense. Uh, spoiler, this will be the topic of next week's video. But uh, my personal opinion on this is that this is better because it makes the code easier to write and it removes, um, it removes mandatory code that is basically boilerplate code in the sense that it's just there because it has to be there, but it doesn't really serve a purpose because there is already something else serving that purpose. I don't know if you see what uh, what I mean, but basically what I mean is that when you have weak self and when you have unwrapped it, um, it's perfectly safe to use self inside the closure. So why uh, why should the compiler and the language force the developer to write self? Uh, it can be even a bit like cumbersome because if you pass in the result of a method as an argument to another method, you will find yourself with having a lot of self inside um, inside your code. Uh, it might also break consistency a bit in your code in the sense that uh, normally we don't use self as a prefix when uh, writing Swift code. Most guide style guide that I've seen and most projects I've worked on don't do it. So having some part of your code that does it always feel a bit uh, a bit weird. So personally, I'm kind of in favor of that kind of change, especially because it's really like uh, uh, you like it, you can adopt it. If you don't like it, you can still use the, the, previous, uh, the previous version. Uh, something that will be interesting will be to see if tools like Swift format that uh, reformat your code uh, when you commit it according to some predefined rules, uh, whether this tool will by default enable a rule to remove all the unnecessary self-enclosures following this new feature being released. That will be interesting to see if this rule is uh, an opt-in by default. Back to the topic now. So alternative considered. It is technically possible to also support implicit self before self has been unwrapped. Like, so that's, a section, that, that's the thing we saw that was forbidden, that, the, the for, that they forbid, uh, for, uh, that, they, that they chose to forbid. But uh, what they're saying is that here, actually, this syntax could be valid because here you would have an, you would have an implicit self question mark but they didn't choose to have it be valid and because they say that would effectively add implicit control flow, that control flow being that the call to dismiss could not happen because self could be nil. Dismiss would only be executed when self is not nil without any indication that it may run, that it may not run. Uh, we could create a new way to spell this that still implies optional training, like 
question mark dot dismiss, but that is not meaningfully better than the existing self question mark dot dismiss spelling. And I think it's really interesting to see that, uh, yeah, this is where they, they drew the line that um, it's nice to add convenience, ergonomics, and quality of life features, basically like a sugar syntax feature, but you've got to draw the line because it's always a fine line between a uh, useful sugar, sugar syntax and uh, cryptic, uh, cryptic symbols to make your code uh, faster. I think like the typical poster child of that is uh, overloading uh, operators and uh, like C++ has, uh, has had a, a very good history of proving why uh, overloading operators like crazy is not a good idea. So here, this would be kind of like if the compiler overloaded the question mark operator. And yeah, this would feel weird. This would not feel swifty at all. So I understand why they didn't consider that. But it's interesting to see that uh, they've considered it. And also because it shows us like the, the edge cases of, uh, of the feature. And finally, the acknowledgments. So they thank the authors of the previous proposal that was that laid the ground for that proposal. They thank Kale Slaughter for the suggestion to not permit self in cases where the unwrapped self value doesn't necessarily refer to the closure self. So this is the example we saw before. So it's interesting also to see the, the thanks because it shows that um, it's really like a, a collaborative uh, work to make such a, a proposal. You have to take in feedback from uh, different groups and uh, try to like uh, make it uh, make sense, uh, basically. So always interesting to see that it's not like just one person having like a stroke of genius and uh, writing and finding all of the possible edge cases. No, this is a collaborative work with a lot of discussions uh, and we are seeing a glimpse of it and you will see more of it if you watch the video next week, which I have been teasing a lot in this live. Uh, and then uh, the, the offer is thanking the reviewers uh, and people who give feedback and advice. So I don't know who all of these people are, but I know that John McCall is someone very active on the Swift forums. Uh, I think he works for Apple, but I am not 100% uh, sure actually. That shows that I don't act particularly follow the Swift forums, even though I should, but uh, there's only so many hours in a day. Um, I see an interesting comment in the chat. So Victor is saying they could go for a different coloring for the fun call if it's a matter of signaling optionality to reader syntax is not the only avenue. This is very interesting. Um, they could do it. They could do it. But you need to consider in which context will the code be read. For instance, Xcode could indeed offer a different uh, syntax, but maybe not all the other tools will. And for instance, uh, not all the code review tools will support that new syntax. For instance, GitLab or GitHub might not support it or might not support it um, out of the box. So actually for a language feature, I would argue that um, relying, uh, I mean, let me, I want to phrase it uh, the good way, like uh, uh, having uh, a language feature use color syntax can be good if it's a nice to have, but uh, the feature shouldn't rely on the syntax coloring because basically there will, be a, al there will always be a context where the syntax coloring won't be working as expected and so it shouldn't carry uh, a, strong, uh, a strong meaning. Uh, and we need to also consider like uh, accessibility questions, like uh, not everyone can see uh, colors uh, with the same uh, acu acuity. But um, I still find the idea of uh, conveying more information through syntax coloring, interesting. I'm curious uh, about whether, like, uh, I'm sure there must have been like languages that uh, that went uh, down that road just uh, just for the fun uh, for the fun of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't recall actually seeing uh, instances where uh, a different syntax coloring would uh, carry a different uh, meaning for uh, for a piece of code. But that's an interesting uh, interesting idea. And talking of interesting ideas, we've just finished the proposal about these very interesting suggestions. So it's time we move on to the second one. So I'm looking at the time. I was afraid that one went to be too fast, but actually, no, we are 25 minutes in and the goal for me is to do like a, a live that lasts about one hour. I think it will be a little bit less than one uh, hour. So let's move on to the second proposal. 
which is called Add Custom Debug String Convertible Conformance to Any Key Path. So a very uh, programming, uh, programming name, a very long, uh, very long name. Uh, finding a way to fit these names in the title of uh, YouTube Live is always a bit of a, of a challenge. <laughs> Um, so first, let's take a look at who the author is. So Ben Pius um, doesn't seem someone working at uh, at Apple. Might be someone from the community, uh, actually. Um, at least there is not an at Apple uh, email uh, email address here. So it's interesting to see that we see more and more changes coming from the community uh, being, uh, being implemented. So going all the way through, uh, through the process. So let's start reading the proposal. Introduction. This proposal is to add conformance to the protocol custom debug string convertible to any key path. Motivation. Currently, passing a key path to print or to the PO command in NLDB yields the standard output for a Swift class. This is not very useful, For instance, given a struct theme with two stored properties, background color and foreground color, and one compute property overlay, if we do print, so a key path to the background color property on the theme type, we would have an empty of roughly, so basically like the, yeah, the, the, the type, so key path of theme, of a key path you can invoke on a theme to get a color, so key path with root as theme, and value as color, and it doesn't allow foreground color to be distinguished from any other property on the theme. Ideally, the output would be to just spell out what is the literal symbol for that key path. So here, backslash theme dot background color, exactly as it was written in the program. So when I saw this proposal, First, I was like, uh, won't it be a little bit too niche uh, to discuss about it? And then I remember that I actually um, found myself in a situation where I would have needed this feature and I had no way of uh, generating it because I think they will discuss it, but uh, it's a language feature. You have no way of uh, printing this output from a key path without adding something to the language. And my use case was that I had tried to make a small framework to write tests uh, using a key path and using a result builder. So basically you would say assert on a value and then pass in a closure where you would say, for instance, assert that uh, backslash dot background color equal red, I don't know, assert that foreground color equal black, etc. And if you want to have a meaningful error uh, message in your when your test fails, which is super important because the goal of a test is to provide a meaningful message of why it failed, uh, you want to be able to print what's the name of the property that generated the error and you couldn't do it. And um, without that, it made the... Um, The, the framework more a proof of concept than something that you could like use because if you're looking at logs, uh, I mean, not having that printing out makes it like super unfriendly. Uh, so actually, once this is in, this is uh, released, I might update my old uh, key path testing library and try to, I don't know, like uh, see if people are interested in, uh, in using it. Like the code is on GitHub. You can find it on my, uh, on my profile and I'm looking forward to updating it. So what's the proposed solution? Take advantage of whatever information is available in the binary to implement the debug description requirement of custom debug string convertible. I'm still a bit sick and I feel like I'm going to sneeze at some point. <laughs> in the best case, roughly the output above will be produced. So that output here, in the worst cases, other potentially useful information will be output instead. So the idea is to say best case we output this, which is like the best information you can have in the log to understand what the key path was about. And worst case, if there isn't all the possible information, uh, try to print as much useful thing as is available, basically. So detailed design, implementation of custom debug string convertible. Much like the underscore project functions currently implemented in keypath.swift, 
this function would loop through the key paths buffer handling each segment as follow. So here I think they are referring to the implementation of key path, which you can take a look at because it's part of the um, uh, I think it's part of the Swift standard library which is implemented in Swift. So you can take a look at it on GitHub. It's super interesting to do so. It's a bit challenging depending on uh, which code you are looking at, but um, I did a few live streams and even a video about it. Uh, I did a video looking at uh, how uh, functions like map or flat map are implemented in the standard library, and uh, it's pretty interesting to uh, take a look uh, take a look at it once again because it gives you like a real a real world example of what does code that is used by virtually every single Swift program uh, looks like. So that's super interesting for inspiration um, and that kind of stuff. So for offset segments, the implementation is simple. Use get recursive child count, get child offset, and get child metadata to get the string name of the property. I believe these are the same mechanism used by, mir by mirror today. So here I get what, what they're saying is that basically um, a key path in its implementation, you have a buffer that lets you traverse the property that the key path is referring to. One of these possible um, one of these possible buffer uh, segment can be what's called an offset segment, which I guess says, okay, the property is at this offset in memory from the base address um, of the value. So we're getting into some uh, low level stuff here. And they're saying that knowing that offset, you can get the metadata, which is the name of the property. And that this is actually what the type mirror already uh, uses. For optional chain, force and wrap, etc., the function appends a hard coded question mark or exclamation mark as appropriate, meaning that you can basically like uh, get the symbol and generate it on the fly. And for computed segments, call Swift lookup symbol on the result of getter in the computed XOR pointer, demangle the result to get the property name. So uh, by computed segment, I guess there might be some segment of a key path that has to be computed. So uh, a typical example I can envision, it's uh, something that's not uh, that widely known, but um, in a key path, you can uh, use a subscript, for instance. If you take a key path to an array, you can take a key path to the first or second or third element of the array, and the value you pass in, um, the value you pass in uh, as the argument of the subscript could be the result of uh, a method call, for instance. So I'm not sure now. Actually, they're not talking about that because that method, it would be evaluated when the key path is created. Um, I guess, no, I mean, um, it's, it's more straightforward. It's simply that you could take a key path um, like on a protocol, for instance, uh, and then the method could be implemented by, uh, by, dif by different uh, types. So that could be like a witness table. So that might be the, the case why the symbol has to be, uh, has to be looked up. Um, here I'm making hypothesis. I'm not 100% sure what this part uh, refers to, but we don't need to understand it with 100% confidence to get the, the general idea of the, of the proposal. So changes to Swift runtime. To implement descriptions for compute segments, it is necessary to make two changes to the runtime. First, expose a Swift calling convention function to call Swift lookup symbol because as the name suggests, this function is a C++ function. And so you need to do some uh, calling convention. Uh, it's some kind of binding to be able to call Swift, uh, no, to be able to call C++ functions from uh, Swift. Um, something interesting is that the Mirror API is also implemented that way. And there is a blog article on Swift.org that explains it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it's a very technical read. Uh, I didn't read it all the way through, but uh, it's interesting. Like only, even if you last for like four four paragraphs, and then you're like, okay, like I don't have the the time to focus on that. Uh, these four paragraphs will still be interesting because you learn uh, a few cool stuff about uh, how it, how does it work to be able to call a C plus plus function just like if it were just like if it were a Swift function. And second, implement and expose a function to demangle key path functions without the ornamentation the existing demangling functions produce. Okay, uh, dealing with missing data, there are two known cases where data might not be available. 
So first, type metadata has not been emitted because the target was built using the Swift Disable Reflection Metadata flag. So apparently when you build Swift, you can add a flag that uh, removes all the reflection metadata from the binary. That's interesting. I didn't know about that. But I guess it can be interesting for like, uh, I don't know, like uh, obfuscation. Yeah, obfuscation, uh, prevent reverse engineering, that kind of thing. Or the linker has stripped the symbol names we are trying to look up. Okay. In these cases, we would print the following. So for an offset case, offset the value of the offset and the type name, where x is the memory offset we read from the reflection metadata, and type name is a type that will be returned. So print this key path here would output theme, and then instead of the name of and then instead of printing the name of the property which we don't have, we write this, which is a bit more low level, but uh, it fits the philosophy of uh, we're going to print whatever data uh, that we have. Um, if lookup symbol doesn't work, then here it would just print the address in memory plus the name of the type. So you still get the name of the value. So what you would have gotten before. So once again, it's like more information could be useful, could be not. As it might be difficult to correlate the memory address with the name of the function, the type name may be useful to provide extra context. Okay, source compatibility. Programs that extend any key path to implement custom debug string convertible themselves will no longer compile, and the author of such code will have to delete the conformance. So if you had implemented it uh, yourself, you will need to remove that conformance and basically use the one that will now be part of the language. Based on a search of GitHub, there are currently no publicly available Swift projects that do this. It's interesting because <laughs> if I had at the time in my own very tiny project tried to make a potentially and most certainly broken, or it is not broken, but uh, not fully exhaustive implementation of uh, custom debug string compatible for any key path, maybe I would have ended up in the proposal by uh, of having the only project on GitHub that would have uh, supported this. But still, it's, inter it's very interesting to see that. Uh, when they need to make a decision, like the Swift team uses a heuristic, like, okay, we're going to search on GitHub and see if people are uh, actually uh, using, uh, you are actually using the, um, the, I want to phrase it with the right word. It's not a language feature, but uh, if the thing that will no longer be supported, are people using it or not? So it's interesting to see the, what goes into the decision-making process. Calling print on a key path will, of course, produce different results than before. So if you were uh, relying on that, you will need to update your code. Um, I'm not sure if some people rely on it. It is unlikely that any. It is unlikely that any Swift. It is unlikely that any existing Swift program is depending on the existing behavior in a production context. While it is likely that some somewhere that someone somewhere has written code in unit test, I was about to say I was about to say that this is much more likely to happen in a unit test than in a production uh, context, or at least I hope not, because that would be uh, like the biggest code smell uh, ever. <laughs> Uh, so why is it likely that someone somewhere has written code in unit test that depends on the output of this function? Any issues with the result will be easy for the authors of such code to identify and fix, and will likely represent an improvement in the reliability of those tests. So it's like, yes, it might break something, but also it will be easy to fix. It will make everything so much better for the people that had something that broke, that, that broke, that, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, let's consider it acceptable uh, damages. Effect on ABI stability. This proposal will add a new var and protocol conformance to the shared to the standard libraries ABI. It will it will be okay. It will be availability guarded appropriately. So there will be an uh, available. So I guess it will be available for Swift version and not an iOS uh, version. Uh, I hope. Actually, that might not even be the the case. Uh, that's interesting. Like uh, maybe maybe not. Um, the new, uh, the, they are answering the question just after, the new debugging output will not be back deployed. So Swift programs running on older ABI stable versions of the OS won't be able to rely on the new output. Um, honestly, since this is most likely, since this will most likely be useful in, uh, in tests, so uh, on uh, machines that uh, you have control over, uh, you will be able to update to the latest, the latest macOS hopefully and be able to use it. So, 
I think it will be one of the rare features that is only available in the newest uh, version of uh, macOS. Uh, I guess for that case, because it will be for machines running uh, Xcode or XCBuild. Uh, but you don't care because actually it's the machine that you use for, for developers, so it's, uh, it's your machine. Effect on API resilience. The implementation of debug description might change after the initial work to implement this proposal is done. In particular, the output format will not be guaranteed to be stable. Here are a few different changes we might anticipate making. So, as new features are added to the compiler, there may be new metadata available in the binary to draw from. One example would be lookup tables of key path segments to human readable name or some other unique stable identifier. Whenever a new feature is added to key path, it will need to be reflected in the output of this function. For example, the key path produced by for each field with key path are incomplete in the sense that they merely set a value at an offset in memory and do not call did set observers. If this function were ever publicly exposed, it would be useful if this was surfaced in the debugging information. So I guess this is a private behavior of the Swift standard library because there is an underscore in front uh, of it uh, and one with, speci uh, with special behavior because it doesn't call did set. Um, the behavior of subscript printing might be changed. For example, we might always print out the value of the argument to the subscript or we might do so only in cases where the output is short. So they're talking about what I mentioned earlier, you can take a, a key path to a, a subscript with a, a specific value. We might also change from dot subscript um, parenthesis to uh, brackets. I don't use that word that much in, uh, in English. Yes, brackets. Um, so yeah, they're basically saying like, don't rely on uh, what we write in the debug description because we might change it. But that has always been the case of both debug description and description that Apple tells you uh, don't rely on it because uh, you might find yourself in a pickle someday. A good example of this is that uh, a lot of apps used to rely on the description method of uh, NS data to get the, the push uh, notification token. And when implementation of uh, description on data changed a uh, couple, uh, two or three or four years ago, uh, well, these apps uh, had uh, broken uh, code and they could no longer uh, get the get notification token and they had to uh, update, uh, update their code. So don't rely on description or debug description. It should only be written to the console, but your production code should not rely or, or even uh, use it. Alternatives considered, my favorite section. Print fully qualified names or otherwise add more information to the output. So for instance, writing the module name before the type, um, okay. Uh, writing the type and also the literal value of the key path, seeing whether the key path is writable uh, or not. So as this is just for debugging, it seems likely that the information currently being provided would be enough to resolve any ambiguities. If ambiguities arose during a debugging session, in most cases, the user could figure out exactly which key path they were dealing with simply by running PO my key path equal equal the literal syntax until they found the right one. So interesting that they say like, uh, let's keep it simple because yes, we could add all of this information, but it would probably like uh, clutter the, the logs and you don't uh, need it. Uh, need it. Uh, interesting that uh, there is no way to opt in into that uh, extra information. Uh, I guess the, I guess the, yeah, the fact that you cannot pass an argument uh, for that, for to debug description, I don't think there's an argument to be verbose. So you cannot have this uh, this this uh, alternative uh, output as uh, an opt-in feature. Modifying key path to include a string description. That's an interesting thing because indeed, uh, if you take a look at how key path are implemented, and I had tried to do so when I wanted to implement my uh, sorry. I'm starting to feel a bit tired. Uh, I had tried to do so when I was starting to implement my uh, testing library. I noticed that the key path doesn't store a string representation of the literal uh, key path. So let's see what they have to say about it. 
So this would be an obvious solution to this problem, storing uh, a string description of the key path, and would likely be very easy to implement as a compiler already produces uh, a KVC string, which is for compatibility of uh, Swift key path with key value uh, coding in Objective-C. It has the additional advantage of being 100% reliable to the point where it arguably could be the basis for implementing description rather than debug description. So they're like hyping it up saying like, wow, it would be so amazing. So I guess the reason why they don't do it will be like uh, super, uh, the argument will be like a really like a clear cut. However, it would add to the code size of the compiled code, perhaps unacceptably so. So you would need to add that string for every uh, key path and it would add to the binary size. Furthermore, it precludes the possibility of someday printing out the arguments of subscript based key path as this can be created dynamically. It would also add overhead to appending key, path, key paths as the string would also have to be appended. So they say like, uh, first, um, adding the string would increase the binary size potentially by a lot. Um, then it wouldn't be um, a full solution because basically it would assume that for a given like uh, key path literal, there is, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the key path literal and the string. And that's not the case when the literal can have a dynamic part, just like when you use, for instance, the return value of a function for a subscript that is used in a, in a key path. And finally, since you can happen to a key path uh, in your Swift code, uh, well, the standard, library, the standard library would also need to append uh, to this string representation, which would make the append uh, operation be a bit longer and would consequently uh, slightly uh, degrade um, performances in production. An alternative implementation of this ID would be the output of additional metadata, a lookup table of function to, of function to name, However, this would require a lot of additional work on the compiler for a relatively small benefit. So they're like, uh, we are already delivering like 90% uh, of the result uh, for um, uh, a cost that is not too high. Uh, maybe uh, it's not worth trying to get the last 10% if it costs like uh, 10 times as much as the first 90%. I think that most users who might want this really want to use it to build something else like encodable key paths. Those features should be provided opt-in on a per key path or per type basis, which will make it much more useful. And in the context of encodable key paths specifically, eliminate major potential security issues. Such a feature should also include the option to let the user configure the string so that it can remain backwards compatible with older versions of the program. So it's true that key paths are not codable by, uh, by design. So for instance, uh, if you have, a, I don't know, like, um, you have, uh, so it's more of a Mac OS case, but uh, you have uh, um, a table displaying some data and you have some columns uh, in the table and you want to make the columns like configurable. So it makes sense that the columns would be properties of a uh, value. So you could think that uh, how should I encode what's the configuration of the table in the user default? I could do it by encoding the key path, which is a reference to the property, the columns display, but you can't, uh, you can do it. Um, and they state one good reason uh, why you can do it is that uh, security would be a, a big concern because if you can encode data using a key path, uh, you could imagine like doing, um, creating like a, a malicious serialized, serialized data that would maybe put uh, intentionally wrong data uh, for a key path or maybe like switch a key path for another. So I know that... Uh, in um, in the Objective C world, uh, there was NS coding, and then there was NS secure coding to make sure that uh, these kind of attacks were not uh, possible. So, uh, what they're basically saying is that uh, making key paths encodable uh, has some risk of its own, and you really want to be like sure about it and uh, not try to squeeze it in uh, as part of uh, of adding a, a feature um, that should just help for debug. Like basically, they want to say like we don't want to add a feature that makes debugging a bit nicer and end up with people building stuff that will be a major security threat for programs built with the Swift language. All right, and then make key path functions global to prevent the linker from stripping them. 
this would also potentially make it feasible to change this proposal from implementing debug description, debug description to implementing description. To be honest, I'm not really sure what's the difference between debug description and description. And I feel like if I'm not sure about it, it would make for interesting topic for, uh, for a short video because uh, I take quite some time uh, learning about Swift. And if I'm not sure about this, chances are a lot of other people are not sure about it also. So I will make like a mental note to, uh, to maybe uh, do a video about this in the future. Uh, this would also potentially bloat the binary and would increase linker times. It could also be a security issue as DL, uh, DLYSM would now be able to find these functions. I am not very knowledgeable about linkers or how typical Swift build, builds strip symbols, but I think it might be useful to have this as option in some ideas that build Swift programs, but that is beyond the scope of the proposal. So they're saying like, yeah, let's, we want to do a nice quality of life improvement. Let's not try and uh, break everything or uh, start uh, crazy endeavors. Let's keep it uh, simple. And finally, future directions. So this is also interesting because this is where the author like consider like uh, once a proposal has been uh, accepted, what could be the, the next step um, for the, the direction they started to, uh, to explore? So here they're saying uh, adding LLDB formatters or summaries. I'm not sure what they are. Uh, this would be a good augmentation to this proposal and might improve the developer experience as there might be debug metadata available to the debugger that is not available in the binary itself. However, I think it might be very difficult to implement this. I see two options. First, implement the public reflection API for key paths in the Swiss library that the formatter can interact with from Python. Two, the formatter parses the raw memory of the key path, essentially duplicating the code in debug description. I think one is overkill, especially considering the limited potential applications of this API beyond its use by the formatter. It's possible to implement this as an internal function in the Swift stdlib, then this is a much, if it's possible, then it's a much more attractive option. From personal experience, trying to parse key path memory from outside the standard library, I think Q would be extremely difficult to implement and unsustainable to maintain considering that the memory layout of key paths is not ABI stable. I won't lie. I haven't understood uh, more than half of what I have uh, read especially because I am not sure of what are the LLB formatters uh, summaries. Um, I guess it's something that is implemented in the debugger, so LLDB, and that would run to like provide even more information about um, the code you are debugging and the uh, key path could be part of, uh, of that code. Uh, and so the thing like uh, that LLDB could actually provide this debug description instead of um, the code in the Swift uh, standard library, uh, but saying that uh, it's overkill because moving that responsibility of printing a readable description of the key path to LLDB would either like um, make Swift generate uh, way too much information in the in the build, which would not be good for performance and even for security, or it would need um, Swift to make the memory layout of a key path be part of basically like uh, the, the public uh, ABI. So what Swift has to support uh, in, the, in, in the future and the key path memory layout is not part of it today. And uh, I guess, yeah, making something part of the ABI is very important because it means like basically like uh, you can never change it or if you change it, you have to take like a big uh, performance uh, hit. So that's why uh, they said it would be not that much of a great idea. And then make key path functions global in debug builds only. So kind of like what was suggested a bit earlier by saying let's do it only in debug and not in, uh, in production, which I guess would make sense because you would use the, the, the output of debug description in like debug builds, uh, either like when doing dev or when running tests. So... Um, what is said is that this may be necessary to allow Swift lookup symbols to function correctly on Windows, Linux, and other platforms that use CUF or ELF-like format. Uh, okay, so like, I think they're talking about like uh, um, format for like uh, binary files, which I know basically nothing about. So I won't comment this any further because I have just 
nothing to, uh, to say about it. It is way outside my area of uh, expertise and, uh, and competency. And that's it. We have reached the end of this second Swift Evolution proposal. And I see that we are right on time because I wanted to do a one hour live and this is like uh, 55 minutes in. So perfect. So what can I say uh, to conclude? First, if you want to take a look at these two Swift Evolution, Swift Evolution proposal yourself, you have, of course, the link in the description. I hope you have enjoyed this live and uh, learning a little bit uh, uh, in advance about the future features of Swift. Um, what can else can I say? So like I said, next week, there will be a video with someone that contributed a new feature to Swift in the latest version of Swift that will explain like uh, what was the process, how it went. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, recording the video and uh, I learned a lot recording the video. So I hope you're also going uh, going to enjoy it and uh, i guess i just have to say uh, thank you for uh, watching uh, this live the first one after a three month break so hopefully like the the following lives should come like uh, much uh, much sooner i won't wait three more months to make uh, another live but um, that being said uh, yeah thank you for watching and uh, see you next time bye bye